This right here might just be the most underrated 3D printer on the market right now. It's the Vividino Marathon. It's an IDEX printer, independent dual extruders. It's running Clipper firmware, it's got a large build volume, and it's got a variety of other value added features that really set it apart from the competition. Now I've covered other printers from this brand quite extensively on this channel, specifically the Trudon 2.0 and most recently the Trudon Mini. Vividino aka Formbot makes some pretty interesting machines, but they don't get a lot of attention because they don't tend to send them out to influencers. But I do have here with me their latest printer, the Marathon. So today we're going to get into it, we're going to unbox it, and we're going to get it assembled. Multicolor printing has been getting a lot of fanfare as of late, but the solutions that exist today are either quite wasteful, like the Bamboo AMS, or very expensive, like the Prusa XL Tool Changer. The benefit of this IDEX system is that we're not going to have a lot of purge waste when transitioning between colors. So the Marathon has a very interesting niche in today's market, and I think that's what makes it so exciting. So without further ado, let's get into this printer and see what it's all about. If you do enjoy today's video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss my future videos in the Marathon series. We're gonna cut into this box and see what we're dealing with. So if you've never heard of this printer at all, you should go and watch my interview with its designer, Dr. Dan Marinescu. He collaborated with the FormBot team to bring this printer to life. I had a call with him in which he told me all about the features of this printer he told me all of the design considerations and what sets this apart from the other printers on the market today. So we're gonna see just how his vision translated into a real life product. So the first thing I'm seeing here on top of the box are some acrylic panels. So the printer is fully enclosed, so we'll be able to print some high temp materials. So when Dan told me about this printer, he really emphasized the rigidity of the frame and the structural integrity. So the first translation of that concept into real life that we're seeing here is these really industrial looking components. So we have some aluminum extrusions here, which are gonna be the Z-axis uprights. We have ball screws for Z-axis motion. And we also have some bearings here. They're gonna decouple the wobble of the ball screw from the vertical motion of the bed. So we have three Z-axis uprights in total. So one of the other cool features of this printer is that it has kinematic bed leveling. So the bed can tilt, so you can make sure the bed is perfectly parallel to the plane of the gantry. Then we have an independent extrusion here. We have some leveling feet. This is the spool holder. So because this is a dual extrusion printer, we have two spool holders. Looks like we have some handles here. That's gonna make the printer a little bit easier to move around. Here's another aluminum extrusion. And then we have the Z-axis motors, which are installed into the base. We have some couplers in there, uh, just so it doesn't transfer the load from the bed onto the shaft of the motor. That's something that Dan talked about in our call. So he's definitely given a lot of consideration to all of those sorts of things to make sure this printer is going to be reliable. So this is this big solid base of the printer. It makes sense now why this box was so heavy. This is just a big piece of sheet metal. We have this big electronics enclosure with power supply. And it looks like we have our microcontroller installed here. We have a few more acrylic panels. Underneath that, we have a variety of other components, corner pieces for the frame. There's four more. Then we have a bag of hardware. This is fairly hefty, so there's gonna be some assembly involved for sure. I'd say it's about the same amount of hardware that you get with the Trudon 2.0 or Trudon Mini, and that takes around three hours to assemble. Some pretty beefy looking hinges hinged front door and a hinged top door. So it's going to be pretty nice to be able to get in there and work on it when we need to. Okay, now we have the gantry. So we have two tool heads and they're both pre-assembled and pre-mounted on the linear rail here. What I'm seeing, which I didn't know about, but is really cool, is there's a button on top that says unload. So this is probably mapped to some sort of clipper macro, which is gonna unload the filament as soon as you click that. So the really interesting feature of this printer, the X-axis motors are actually internal to the print head, and that moves it along the belt. I think Y-axis motion is more traditional. Yeah, there's a motor mounted back here. So it's definitely an interesting motion system that I personally haven't seen anywhere else. If I flip this over, I can see that there's a light bar, high flow hot ends, so it's got a cylindrical ceramic heater block and it's got a hardened steel nozzle by default. So we're gonna put this aside and we'll see what else is in this box. Next thing I'm seeing is the bed plate. We have some nice 
pieces here that we can grab onto to get the plate off. And we do have some alignment notches on the back as well. It's 10 millimeters thick cast aluminum. We should have good stability as we get up to temperature. It's not gonna deform with thermal stress. Underneath the bed, we have a silicone heater, 650 watts. So it should heat up pretty quick. It looks like it's properly grounded and it does have a thermal fuse. And on the other side of the sheet, one is textured PEI and the other is smooth PEI. Overall, it's a decent size area for single tool printing. As soon as you split this in half to do dual printing, it is gonna get relatively small. It's gonna be this kind of rectangular shape build area. So then we have the screen. It's fairly small. It's a Big Tree Tech TFT 35. We have a stylus for operation. So if you have big fingers, at least you can use that. Or you could consider upgrading to a bigger screen if that's something you're interested in. Allen keys, those will come in handy when we put this together. A few more miscellaneous printed pieces. Some zip ties. Here we have something a little bit more interesting. So when the tool is not active, it's gonna park over this little piece here. That's just gonna prevent it from oozing. So we have two of those, one for each tool. A USB key. And I think this is gonna be the last thing to come out of this box. So we've got two fans on the rear. I think these are just to cool the chamber. And it looks like we have some carbon filters as well. All right, so I have all of the pieces for the Vividino Marathon here on the floor in front of me and I have the assembly instructions right on this computer. The only thing left to do now is get this thing assembled. Assembly begins with the installation of the vertical pillars. The screws are already pre-installed. All we need to do is loosen them off, slide the extrusion in, then tighten them back down. The first two are just structural. The other three form the Z-axis motion system. The ball screw must go inside the coupler before being tightened down. We'll repeat the procedure for the front two corners tightening down the extrusions and the ball screws. I'll then remove the packing tape. Next up is the top frame, which includes the gantry assembly. This gets lowered into position and pushed down over the Z-axis pillars. The fasteners are all in labeled bags. We'll use the M8 by 12 button head screws to secure the frame to the extrusions. Next up are the ooze blockers. This is where the tools will park when they're not in use. There's one for each tool on either side of the frame. The height is adjustable and should be set such that the nozzle touches the metal when the tool is parked. Next up is the bed. We'll set it in place, then secure it with a screw and a nut, one for each of the three fixture points. Now would be a good time to remove the zip ties that held everything in place during transit. The bed heater and thermistor connect with a single, very robust looking connector. I'm then just going to manually turn the ball screws until the bed is at its lowest position. Next, we'll turn our focus to the back panel. Two PTFE couplers get installed first. We'll then loosely attach some T-nuts in preparation for the installation. Two in the middle and two on each side. Before the panel gets installed, we need to add some foam tape for insulation and vibration dampening. One strip on either side and one down the middle. When tightening down the screws, it's important to ensure the T-nuts turn in the extrusion. The screws are short, so you may need to press down to compress the foam. With the printer back upright, we can grab the tool head cable bundles and route them through the holes in the top frame. These then get zip tied to the back panel. Every wire is labeled according to its purpose. The wire labeled fan gets routed out a hole in the panel and plugged into a small breakout board that couples the two exhaust fans. The next connection we'll make is for the chamber thermistor, then the Y-axis motor, and finally the Y-axis optical end stop. Some zip ties will be used to secure the cables in place. Next, we'll remove the tool head cover and plug the bus cable into the tool head breakout board. With the cover off, we get a good look at this orbiter extruder with integrated filament sensor. Very nice. The procedure is repeated for the other tool before replacing the covers. A string relief piece is then secured to the rear of each tool and some zip ties are added to hold it all together. A two-part plastic assembly is used to take up the space between the cable and the frame, anchoring it in place. One set for each tool. PTFE tubes are then inserted and routed through the grommets next to the cables. They exit to the rear through a slot in the panel before being inserted into the couplers. A clever trick with two zip ties will hold the PTFE tube to the cable bundle without crushing it. We'll add two for each tool. 
a quick test to ensure nothing is binding, and then it's on to the enclosure. Starting on the left, we add two strips of foam tape. Remove the protective coating from the clear acrylic, and prepare six sets of screws with T-nuts, three on each side. The panel can then be secured to the frame. The procedure is identical for the right-hand panel. With the printer on its side, we'll take this opportunity to screw in the leveling feet, one for each corner. I used a piece of foam to ensure the acrylic wouldn't get scratched while the printer was on its side. The front doors need to have some metal brackets added, two per door, one on top and one on the bottom. We'll then add the handle, followed by the hinges. The hardware for the hinges is pre-installed, which saves us having to search for the right fasteners. You'll need a wrench to hold the nuts, which is the only tool that's required but not supplied. We can then attach the doors to the front of the printer, ensuring they're properly aligned, and test to make sure they open and close without issue. Each side of the printer gets a handle. This thing is heavy, so you'll need help if you want to move it. Now it's on to the screen. I had trouble getting it plugged in, so I removed it from the printed piece for better access to the connector. It screws to the front of the printer with two screws. The top lid of the enclosure consists of acrylic panels and metal brackets. We'll build the top first, then add the four sides. Another set of brackets forms the bottom structure. We need to be mindful here to make sure the holes on the brackets match the holes on the panel, because they're not all the same. Next is the handle, followed by the hinges. The lid can then be secured to the printer. We screw it to the frame through a set of printed brackets. These act as a stop for the hinges to rest on when the lid is open. Last but not least are the spool holders. I'll first use a knife to remove the foam tape in this area. The spool holder hardware is all pre-installed, so all we need to do is screw it into place. One on the left side and one on the right. So there you have it, the fully assembled Vividino Marathon. I'd say it took around three hours to put together and nothing was particularly difficult about the assembly. The entire printer is very well built and it appears to be well designed. It feels like a super solid frame and all of the components are of high quality. It is definitely a large printer especially relative to its build volume, which just comes by nature of the fact that this is IDEX and these tool heads need to be able to get out of the way of the build area in order for the other one to do its job. So in the next video, we're gonna be looking at the firmware and software configuration for the marathon, and then we're gonna get up and running with our very first prints. If you're not already, make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss that video when it comes out. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and let me know in the comments what you think of this printer. My name's Taylor, this is YGK3D, and until next time, happy 3D printing.